our online viewers as I was sharing with the church today uh, we hope you can uh, visit us uh, here in person we have started now Kayla has blessed us by letting us know that she is going to be leading us in a uh, worship every Wednesday and so we'll get to lift up our voices in song before we do the study in his word uh, we still set apart the prayer session as a private session so you won't be hearing the pro uh, prayer sessions uh, but we are praying for you so if you have prayer petitions please share those with us and today as we study if you have questions or comments please share those with us as well as we have someone monitoring the uh, the screen to to make sure that your your uh, questions and comments are not are not uh, unheard uh, we are in the book of Luke tonight and if you have your Bibles with you if you'll turn to the book of Luke chapter 11 verses 14 to 23. We are, we are closing our series on the miracles of Jesus. As you know that during the summer, we were doing on the various miracles of Jesus. And we've looked at about 12 of them. This is actually the 12th and final uh, study on the miracles of Jesus. And there were many more. And every one of those has a unique message. But tonight's message is, is I think, one that is a really great way to finish this series. Uh, you can never stop with the wrong one. I mean, all of these are great. Uh, but I chose this one for a, a, a special purpose, and you'll see that tonight why. But um, we're looking at transitioning over to a new study series as we enter into the fall. But I hope that this study in uh, the, the miracles of Jesus has been a blessing to you, that you can see not only that there's meaning in the miracle, but that there's also a message in every miracle miracle and that we understand to, to look beyond just the event and see that Jesus is teaching us something and every time that he demonstrates his, his, uh, his uh, divine power uh, by the authority of the Father who had sent him. And so we're closing here on this miracle called Jesus healing a mute man and it's found again in Luke chapter 11 verses 14 to 23. Those of you online if you want to follow us. And this miracle is found in two Gospels. It's found in Matthew chapter 9, verses 32 through 34, and also here in Luke 11, 14 to 23. Now, even though this miracle is limited to two Gospels, this miracle also contains a dialogue. Because after Jesus uh, miraculously heals this mute man, there are people who bring charges against Jesus. They accuse him of doing this work by the power of Beelzebub or Beelzebul. And of course what they are saying is is that his ministry is in league with Satan. And of course Jesus responds to this. So the dialogue that follows the miracle where these Jewish leaders accuse Jesus is actually found in all four Gospels. So it's interesting because you're going to find in Mark and John they report the accusation that Jesus is in league with Beelzebul but they don't report the miracle. So if you only read Mark and John, you wouldn't know that the reason that the people were, were, were uh, motivated to accuse Jesus was because of a miracle. You would think that they just brought up the accusation out of thin air. Uh, the synoptics, all three also include what's called a parable. So if you look at Jesus' response, after he responds to them, he also shares a parable. And we're going to look at the parable as well. And the parable is called the binding of the strong man. And so the reason I selected Luke's version is because it contains all three elements of this miracle. It, uh, Luke's is the most uh, complete of the reporting of this miracle. So there are several things that make this miracle, um, uh, to me, uh, valuable. Number one, it is made up of three components, and you don't see it in any other miracle. You have the miracle itself, then you have the reaction to that miracle both good and bad and especially bad people who accuse Jesus then you have of course Jesus respond to that and then the third element is the parable that he uses so you have the miracle you have the discussion or the discourse that follows and then you have the parable and Luke has all three of these and one of the questions that comes up uh, from this miracle 
is what does it say about Jesus? And I think that when Jesus responds to these attacks and these criticisms, Jesus is asking the people to really think about what they're seeing and really think about how they're reacting to it. And I think it speaks even to our culture today. So uh, without further ado, let's uh, go on to the next screen. Are there any questions or comments about the, the, the uh, miracle before we get started with the reading? Yeah, because because if you only read like maybe Mark's gospel, uh, or not, yeah, well, actually, yeah, Mark's gospel or John's gospel, you'll see that accusation. But that's what I love about Luke's version, and not to say that one gospel is better than the other. Mm -hmm. It's just that they all bring a different perspective. Remember, Luke was what profession? He was, he was a doctor, right? He was a physician. Do you think that the miracles struck Luke harder than maybe the other guys? Absolutely. Because he knows what the body can and can't or should or shouldn't do. He knows a miracle when he sees it. I mean, a mute man, I mean, is just touched and boom, he can speak. He knows that there's something supernatural to that. He knows that there's something divine behind that. Just as much as Matthew reports about the coin in a, in a fish's mouth, the man was a tax collector. So he saw things through, through provision. I mean, that was just his experience. And guys, whether... We know it or not, we all approach Jesus from our own background. You know that, right? I mean, every one of us, when we meet Jesus, we, we meet him carrying our own baggage, wearing different shoes, who have tread very different roads, which is why we as believers and as a community, we have to be compassionate with the kind of people that will walk through that door. There may be some people that walk through that door that you, he's like, I don't get that person. I mean, like, I, don't, I can't relate to them. Uh, or, or maybe they're they're too much for you or whatever. But you got to understand, people have to meet Jesus where they are. And I mean, it could be a homeless man who smells bad. And I mean, I'm not trying to be funny. I mean, I'm serious. I mean, somebody like that could walk through the door, and it's happened before. And if I'm not willing to welcome him and, and hug him, be like, ooh, he's dirty, whatever. Well, I'm going to tell you something. We all were dirty when we met Jesus. It may not be physically dirty, but we were all dirty when we met Jesus. And we have to be willing to understand that people in encounter him in different ways. For Luke, these encounters were on a whole other level for him. And I think that this miracle speaks to that. So there is a beauty to that, you know. Can I say something? Um, when it, you were talking about like where, where people are at. And because I, I think I've shared this with you that when our first few years of our, our walk with Christ, Steve and I, like, I didn't have, I didn't know what it was like to have a church family. I didn't know, um, all I knew was this is a Bible, and so we would do the best that we could. We had no leadership to hold us accountable to things or, you know, uh, to teach us, um, you know, that wisdom and, and everything else, including how to study the Bible. So for the first few years of walking with Christ, I didn't have a study Bible, and so I would look to, you know, Dr. Google <laughs> and um, yep. YouTube videos. And, and there was so much information. It's like, who's right and, and what's what? And, um, and it wasn't until I really started um, seeing how you or Rudy or, or, you know, Brother Lee or, you know, people when they're up here teaching and, and how it is to study and having the study Bible and understanding to use commentary and references, it is so important because it it doesn't make sense when you don't try to put the puzzle together. Yes, well, thank you. And, and I think that's a message for everybody out there. If you're listening out there and you don't have a, a church home, I want to challenge you to rethink what you're doing because the idea of like, well, I don't really need church uh, to follow God is a lie from the devil. Uh, I, I'll give you a, a shiny quarter I'll give you two shiny quarters. If you can show me one individual in the scriptures who God ever called to go at it alone. We were made to be a community. There's a reason why he calls us a flock. A flock means more than one. Jesus says where there are two or three gathered. The gathering, he talks about uh, how blessed it is when, when the people gather together. 
And, 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 and one of the reasons for it is because you're not fully equipped to really study the scriptures the way you need to. I'm not trying to insult anybody out there. But I look back before I had my for, formal studies, and, and I'm not talking about my doctorate or my you know degrees and all that stuff. I'm talking about just people who, who have de dedicated and devoted their time to study the scriptures. They're going to have a, a unique insight, especially the formal studies, to understand it from a different perspective. Not that some people are smarter than you or not, but for example, there were elements of the Greek here that play into my translation. Now, unless you're proficient in Greek or in Hebrew, you're not going to see it. And uh, it, it's not to boast, it's to explain that you have to find yourself a Bible-based church where people are really devoted to the understanding of Scripture. But what's happening today is you have a bunch of guys up there, and I keep saying this, in skinny jeans, walking around and trying to give motivational speeches. You don't need motivational speeches. You need truth. And hopefully you'll get a little bit of that tonight. So thank you. Uh, so everybody there, Luke 11, 14 to 23? Amen? All right. I'm going to read it in the uh, ESV version. And <clears throat> follow along with me here. It says... Now, he was casting, of course, speaking of Jesus. Now, Jesus was casting out a demon that was mute. When the demon had gone out, the mute man spoke, and the people marveled. But some of them said, he casts out demons by Beelzebul, the prince of demons. While others, to test him, kept seeking from him a sign from heaven. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and a divided household falls. And if Satan also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? For you say that I cast out demons by Beelzebul. And if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore they will be your judges. But if it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are safe. But when one stronger than he attacks him and overcomes him, he takes away his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoil. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. Amen. What uh, before I I start here, where, where the, maybe you're reading an NIV version or a different version, or maybe something stuck out to you when you heard this. What are your thoughts when you hear this? Just no wrong answer. What were your thoughts when you when you heard this or read this story? Jesus. Say are, it again. They are questioning Jesus. So there's the fundamental thing here in the story is they are questioning Jesus, right? So that's what Luke is trying to do. And so I don't know if you snuck a peek at my notes, Marty, but that's that's really where I'm going. I know you weren't, you did, but that's exactly right. Luke is concerned not not just with the miracle, but with its implications. Go back and you watch how Luke presents every miracle, and every time he's not just saying, "Oh, here's what Jesus did. Here's what Jesus did. Here's what Jesus did." He's saying, "Here's what Jesus did. What do you think that means?" He's constantly pushing that to the reader. Now, who do you think Luke wrote the go his gospel for? For Jews or for Gentiles? Gentiles. Okay. So Gentiles, did they have a background in Abraham and Jacob and Isaac and Isaiah and Jeremiah? No. 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 So Luke has this great challenge, which obviously under divine inspiration did so in, in perfect fashion. How do I present... The son, think of this. How do I present the son of God to a people who don't know God? Before I can tell you who Jesus is, you first got to know who God is. And these people, these Gentiles, didn't know this God. Now, to the Jew, you could say, this is the Messiah, the son of God. Well, they know God. His name is, is, is Jehovah, right? Yahweh. And he was the one who led our people through the wilderness. But there was no history with the Gentiles. And, and I'm sharing all this because I'm prepping you. Because later on when, when Jesus begins to speak of the kingdom, uh, this is very, very important for Luke to explain to his readers, 
you need to understand what kind of God and what kind of Jesus this man was or what kind of Messiah Jesus was. So one of the things that, that Luke does in order to teach this is to show and communicate the different reactions that people had with Jesus. He's saying, man, Jesus did some incredible things, but amazingly, not everybody, despite all his great works and miracles, not everyone believed, not everyone responded. And what he wants is the person to read this and go, what? The guy makes a, a mute man talk for the first time speaks, and not everybody's just amazed and, and seeing what's happening. What's wrong with these people? He wants them to, to see how ridiculous uh, his opponents, to what level, what point of resistance they got. Because the whole question is here is, is what is the source of Jesus' miracles? That's, that's kind of what's being asked here. And I want you to understand that Jesus' ministry included very commonly uh, expelling demons from people and the reactions were mixed with this especially when it came to dealing with demonic activity since we're in the gospel of luke let me just give you some examples luke does this consistently just so you can see what i mean go to luke chapter 4 verses 31 to 37 luke chapter 4 verses 31 to 37 let me show you three different responses to jesus in his miracles luke 4 31 to 37. And Jesus went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and he was teaching them on the Sabbath. And they were astonished at his teaching, for his word possessed authority. And in the synagogue, there was a man who had the spirit of an unclean demon. Notice the demonic activity again. And he cried out with a loud voice. And I need to put my, my glasses, sorry. I just went completely... Ha, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. So the demon recognizes who Jesus is. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And when the demon had thrown him down in their midst, he came out of him, having done him no harm. And they were all amazed and said to one another, What is this word? For with authority and power he commands the unclean spirits, and they come out. And reports about him went out into every place in the surrounding region. How would you de describe that reaction? Positive or negative? Positive. Positive. These people here were, were convinced that what they were seeing was the work of God. Go with me now to Luke chapter 6. What, what I noticed in this this verse is that they were in the synagogue. I don't know where this other setting is in this other one, but I'll see. Okay, yeah, that's that's a good point. The setting can make a big difference, right? All right, so look at Luke chapter 6, verses 17 to 19. Luke's, uh, I'm sorry, Luke chapter 6, verses 17 through 19. And it says, And he came down with them and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea and Jerusalem and the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon, who came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And those who were troubled with, here it is again, unclean spirits were cured. And all the crowd sought to touch him, for power came out from him and healed them all. When you look at these two reactions to Jesus leading up to this, and there's a reason why Luke depicts these two reactions when it comes to Jesus' work with demonic activity and spirits and unclean spirits, as is described here, you're going to see that he's prepping you. Some were astonished, amazed, and some were receptive, seeking to touch Jesus. They saw it, and they were, and they were, they were attracted to it. They, they wanted to get closer. They, they wanted to seek him. But then we see here in Luke chapter 11 that some were hostile. And we see specifically the scribes and the Pharisees who are leading this campaign to attack Jesus and who react with a similar hostility. Notice that when they see what happens, they never deny the, the miracle. They don't say, no, I don't believe that this, you know, maybe they could say, well, this is a magician or this isn't real. Never once to these opponents of Jesus 
deny the, the miracle itself. So when they're unable to answer the reality of that miracle, they come up with some other way to smear it. And that happens in everything. When it comes to people who, have you ever met stubborn, hard-hearted people? People that no matter what evidence you give them, they just won't believe. And I don't mean, and I don't mean just uh, um, uh, in, in, in faith. It could be in anything. People that just absolutely, yeah, and, and you can present them the evidence, and they still won't admit it. And those people are frustrating. They're frustrating to deal with when you present evidence after evidence, this, uh, and you're like, I, what can I do with you? And that's what Luke is wanting to present here. He's wanting to present a scenario where the people had already made up their mind about Jesus despite all the evidence. And so <clears throat> notice verse 14. Notice that Jesus heals the mute man by casting out what kind of a demon? He's mute. So a lot of people think, well, this man uh, was possessed by a demon and the demon shut his mouth. No, the demon itself was, was, was mute. Isn't that interesting? It means that the, that the demons themselves, they're not divine and, and all-powerful. The demons themselves are afflicted. That's, that's their nature. They're cursed and they're afflicted. And they bring their affliction into those who they would be able to influence. There's nothing good or positive about a demon. And I can remember there was a, a, a cartoon that I saw um, years and years ago uh, about a little kid who meets a little demon who's, who, has, um, who has been separated, I think, from whatever, the family or whatever, and they befriend each other. And this little demon, uh, you know, they become friends and they go on this adventure together. And I'm like, that is the, the, the worst propaganda I've ever seen. There's nothing positive, there's nothing good that can come out from being in any kind of way re related or connected with evil or demonic activity. And when you know that people are not of God, you better stay clear. It's that simple. That's why, like Madi and I, with, with our kids, we always say, in choosing who to be with, be with someone who fears and knows God. I don't care about anything else. You know, uh, because it will be a burden and it will be a hindrance uh, to deal with people who have no fear of God. So here Jesus heals this mute man, not just as a medical situation, but as a possession. So this is unique. So you have a miracle healing, but you also have a demonic, a demonic ousting of a spirit. So you have both in one here. And the demon was mute, then he possessed the man, and so the man became what the demon was. So he couldn't speak. His mouth was shut. And I was thinking about this. And I've heard stories of people who have suffered from addiction or abuse, who felt that they were muted in their affliction and that they were unable to cry out for help. I remember this um, one story of this, this uh, woman who was, uh, being, uh, who was suffering from domestic abuse, physical abuse. Uh, her husband was beating her, who was uh, making her life a living hell. And that there were moments in her life where people were, where she had a chance to cry out or a chance to ask for help, but she was so overcome with fear and terror, she said that she couldn't, she couldn't express it. And I wonder sometimes if these kinds of things are not the work of demonic activity. Understand that sometimes people who are in need of help, they may be just as much oppressed by demonic activity as they are by actual people. Does that make sense? And, and we have to have eyes to see that because sometimes somebody could be a, a victim of drugs or alcohol, uh, but there's more afoot than just the drugs or the alcohol. There's more afoot than just than just the physical effects of the dependence. There's demonic activity connected to that. I don't know if y'all seen it on TV. Um, you go like to Portland, Oregon or Seattle, there's areas of the city, they look like walking zombies. There's a drug that they take and they're just hunched over and they're just standing there like this and they're not moving. It's, it's almost eerie and, and, and scary. Um, a person went through that area of the town and there were hundreds of people just standing around not moving but they're under the influence of this drug and they're just standing there and just hunched over and they're not moving. Um, that, when I see that, I say, that is not only the work of a drug, but of a demonic uh, force. And so we have to have eyes to see that. Uh, questions or comments on 14? 
Good. So Jesus performs the miracle. And, and it's interesting because Luke tells it all in one verse. Jesus, cast, he sees it for what it is. There's a demon possessing this man. That demon is mute, and therefore this man is mute. I cast out this, this demon. This man is free and able to speak. And so it happens. And the, the mute man spoke. Now, we don't know what the mute man said. I wish I could. I mean, I wish I wish we would know what he, what he said, right? Praise God. Uh, did he say thank you or what he said? But it says that the people marveled. So there's this awe. So it seems like there's this positive response to it at first, right? But then we see in verse 15 that infamous but. But some of them said, He casts out demons by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, while others, to test him, kept seeking from him a sign from heaven. So immediately you see a, a negative response here. The mixed reactions. Some people marvel, but the Jewish leaders begin a smear campaign. They decide that despite what they've seen, that they're going to do everything they can to accuse him of being in league with the devil. While others, if you notice verse 16, it says, continue to doubt and test him, seeking a sign from heaven. Let me, let me respond to that group first before I go to the people that accuse him of being in league with the devil. I sit here and I go, how in the world did Jesus just heal this mute man and that there were others test, to test him kept seeking from him a sign from heaven. Is it just me or do you not find yourself asking, what else do you want? What more do you want? But I think that's what Luke is trying to show you here. That there are still those seeking or waiting, not just for any sign, but for their own prescribed signs. Mm -hmm. Have you ever heard that joke, uh, the story of the man, there was a, a huge flood and the, the house is overrun by water there's just it's coming through and the man has no choice but to get on the roof and he begins to pray lord save me you've heard the story right and a boat comes by hey jump on the boat no no i pray to the lord and i know the lord's going to save me so the boat goes on and then a helicopter helicopter comes by and they say hey get on the ladder he goes no 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 i'm praying to the lord and then soon there's a man on the embankment who he's got a lifesaver float throws it out there hey grab onto that lifesaver float no 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 god's going to save me eventually the house collapses, the man drowns, he goes to the to heaven and he's angry at God. Lord, I prayed, why didn't you save me? He says, well, I sent three people. The, it's funny, but that's the same situation here. Here, here were people who decided, I'm not going to believe unless you do it my way. Unless you impress me and you show me the evidence that I need to believe. Well, that's a person that Luke is showing here. That's a person that... that that is doomed from the beginning, just like these Pharisees. They're just as bad as the Pharisees who refuse to believe. So, making God follow your terms or expecting God to respond to your, your, your expectations is just as bad as refusing altogether. Because neither one is, is, is leads to faith, because neither one is receptive. And I think that's what he's saying here. So now, uh, any questions on that? Okay, so now let's look at this, this claim that Jesus is with Beelzebul. That word Beelzebul, or some of, some of you may have Beelzebub, it comes from the Hebrew term Baal. And we know about Baal, the god Baal. All you got to do is just go back to, y'all remember Elijah at Mount Carmel? He went up there to, to show the glory of God, and he went against uh, 450 priests of Baal, and then uh, of Asherah. And so we see he takes on about 800 priests, and priestesses, and the main god was Baal. Also in Hosea too. In Hosea too, right? It speaks of of, of uh, Baal, and that's that was the number one rival god. That was the Canaanite god. Now, many scholars believe that Baal derived from the Philistines, who were the seafaring people who came, landed uh, on the shores, and then began to spread that. But there's evidence to show too that there's there's a a long-standing presence of Baal or the god Baal. Uh, even bef before, some, supposedly before they landed, but we're not going to do our history lesson here. The point is, is that this word Baal, which by the way means Lord of the Flies, uh, the Hebrews gave that term. Baal by itself means Lord, but the Hebrews adapted it to mean Lord of the Flies or Lord of Dung. 
obviously because they said this 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 lord of yours is is the lord of the flies there it was a it was a it was a it, it, huh it was like a derogatory yes name. it was like a derogatory name oh baal oh you mean your your god of the flies or your lord of dung so so obviously the 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 hebrews despised baal now zebub zebub or zebo uh means uh, exalted dwelling so baal zebu means uh the lord of his exalted dwelling but by the time of jesus this name of Beelzebul became synonymous with satan for the hebrew it was as simple as that's just another name for the devil so we don't need to go into all the the details of it but here's the point they don't deny the miracle they just attribute it to satan so the accusation here is that jesus's ministry is demonic they just can't deny it. they can't no longer deny that there's some power of some sort there so they have to say well it's not fully though it's actually coming from this place and it's so at that point because they're frustrated that they're like well okay big deal another miracle good for you but again that's only because of it's coming from the wrong place yeah that's exactly what they have to do. yeah so so you uh, is it me or do you not see like some sort of desperation on their part like they're trying to find any kind of way to deny the right. truth right and, and that's what i'm seeing here and <clears throat> To this charge, Jesus responds using logic. He presents to them simple logic. I want you to notice what he says in verses 17 to 19, what I call his discourse on a house divided. Okay? It says, but Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and a divided household falls. Let me just stop there. I don't think that Jesus is just acclaiming this to, to the to the to the kingdom of Satan. I think he's giving an, a, an eternal truth. A kingdom divided against itself will not stand. I have used this term to counsel uh, marriages on the verge of divorce. I've used this term to counsel families that are split and broken because they're arguing over the the inheritance or whatever and this definitely applies also to churches have you seen churches divided against themselves you know the, the enemy is 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 very crafty and a deceiver and what he does so often in the church is he divides people and he knows that a house divided against itself will not stand how do the lions kill the antelope they they divide them and they seclude one and once they get one secluded they surround them and they destroy them and the others in the interest of preserving themselves will just run away but jesus here is i think is speaking the truth not just on the situation of 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 satan's demonic activity but just the truth against itself so i need to say that just because it's important for us to understand jesus is declaring here a truth that we need to remember in our homes with our families uh, with our, our, our church and, and with other brotherhoods and sisterhoods out there, we need to remember the enemy seeks to divide and we need to be as equally diligent to make sure that we stay united. Uh, rumors and uh, uh, temptations, all kinds of things can easily seep in. I'll give you, I'll give you an example. There's a, there's a story about a church, a Baptist church in Georgia. Many years ago, I read this in a, in a in one of my little um, sermon illustrations. This church, true story, they decided that they wanted to do in one of their walls a mural of the Garden of Eden as you know they went into the Bible study rooms. And so the person that was commissioned was doing the mural. And when he got to Adam and Eve, he had a simple question. He said, do I put a belly button on Adam and Eve? So think about it. So you don't think that, that they, because the belly button comes from the umbilical cord, right? So there were there were there was a group that said, well, no, they shouldn't because they were formed out of the ground, and obviously not from a not from the womb. So there would be no umbilical cord to 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 create a belly button. But then there was another group that said, no, he created all of us in in the image that we are, and so 
um, there would still be some sort of belly button there. The issue became so heated that the, that the church actually got divided over the issue. And I thought to myself, you know what you do? I mean, if you're the pastor, just say, put some leaves in front of the, 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 the stomach. You know, just hide it. But the point is, is that sometimes uh, we as a church and we as people, we can find anything to divide ourselves. Uh, we can be so divisive. And, and I think that that's probably the enemy's greatest work is that he takes people even, let's say you have two believers and they may have a difference of opinion on a specific issue of theology and that's enough to divide them. And we need to be stronger than that and more mature than that. And so I think that Jesus is making a very, very important statement here. A house divided against itself cannot stand. So husbands and fathers, one of your primary jobs is to foster unity and love in the household. Mothers and wives, same thing. And if the husband and wife are in love and united, the kids will follow suit. But if the kids see the parents divided, you're going to have chaos. And you need to really work at this because this is where Jesus is pointing to the issue in the kingdom of, of or Satan's working. Uh, and let me keep going because I know I can, I can start preaching on this. Look at verse 18. Simple logic. Remember, Jesus is speaking logically here. He goes, okay, think about it. You're accusing me of being in league with Beelzebub. But we know that a kingdom divided against itself will not stand. It will fall. Verse 18, and if Satan also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? For you say that I cast out demons by Beelzebub. So are you saying that Satan is casting out himself? He says, that's your logic. Your logic is I'm standing here and I'm proclaiming the kingdom of God. I'm saying that I am the son of God. I'm saying that I'm doing the work of God. I'm preaching good news and I'm preaching everything against Satan. And then I'm casting out demons to prove the authority I have. And now somehow... I'm in league with Satan and yet teaching everything against what he stands for. He says, how, how smart is this? How intelligent is your, your thought process here in denying me in this? And then he says something very interesting. In verse 19, he says, And if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. And here's what Jesus is saying there. He said, You yourself have people, priests, who cast out demons. When people have issues and so forth, they come seeking help. And you have your exorcists. You have your people who come and cast out demons. And so supposedly you claim to cast out demons in the name of God. If they are casting out demons in the name of God, you can't have it both ways. If you're saying I'm casting out demons supposedly in the name of God, but really by the power of Beelzebub, so are your, so are your he calls them your children. But he's talking about the people who work with them. So he says to them, therefore, they will be your judges. Whatever you ascribe to me, you're going to have to ascribe to your own people. He's calling out a double, wit, or a double standard. Yes, very good. He's calling out a double standard. He's saying, the measure that you use to judge me, you're not using to yourself. And that's exactly where I'm leading. Because people who are opponents of Christianity, people who don't believe in, 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 in the Bible and all this stuff, never apply the same sort of criticism to their own beliefs. They despise the word of God. They despise God so much that they'll look for any kind of reason. And, and if you notice that there's kind of an apologetic nature to me, like I'll look at something and go, do you notice here that people will accuse this, this, and this? And I always offer you an answer. And you're like, oh, okay, it makes sense. Like you remember when we looked at the different versions of the, the gospels and I said, supposedly they can't be reconciled. And I showed you, well, you know, the... The uh, synagogue, I mean, the, uh, the, the Roman leader wasn't there. But then in this one, it says that he was. And I showed you, well, in the ancient world, if you sent representatives, then technically you were there. And Matthew is just overlooking the fact that he sent representatives. But if these people would apply the same criticisms, and I've, I've shared that with people that I've witnessed to, that people who are so hostile against God, I go, you know, if you apply the same standards of, of measure, to your own beliefs, yours won't stand at all. It, it won't even stand close. He goes, okay, give me an example. I said, okay, you don't believe in God. You only believe in science. Yes, okay. Is there any scientific principle that supports the idea that something can come out of nothing with no cause or with no effect? No. 
Well, your whole basis for reality comes out of a singularity that supposedly is called the Big Bang, in which everything that we have was condensed to, to a singularity, in which everything that we see in the entire universe was compressed that small, which we already know is impossible because we know that when a star fails, it becomes a black hole. And that's just one star, not of trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions, and not only stars, but gas and material and stuff and everything. But somehow, you had the singularity, and for no reason whatsoever, just popped out of everywhere. And by the way, there's no center to the universe. You know, like it says that the universe is expanding, but scientists say there's no way you can find the center that everything popped up, according to them, all at once. So according to your own scientific beliefs, everything that we have appeared out of nowhere, all at once, for no reason, and with no cause. I go, now, apply your standards of criticism to that thought. I go, and that's just the beginning. We haven't, I mean, you haven't even gotten started, and you're already in trouble. And so, when we look at these people that are so critical of Jesus, they're looking any kind of way to deny the, the miracle and the evidence here. But we still have people like that even today. These people are just absolutely convinced that nothing that, that uh, Jesus does is truly of God. And so what you see here is Jesus responding to them. And he's saying, let your own people be the judge. You have this double standard. Apply the same standards to yourself and see where, how far you go. And then you get to verse 20, my favorite verse. I love verse 20. See, because Jesus here is saying, guys, I want you to think about what I'm doing. This world is enemy-occupied territory. And my ministry is evidence that Satan's kingdom is crumbling. Because when he talks about Satan's kingdom being divided against itself, he's actually declaring something to be true. He says, what you see here is not just me performing miracles. But I'm evidencing to you that I am greater than Satan. I'm greater than the demons. I'm greater than these demons that possess these people. I can cast them out. I control all things here. I can cast a demon out of a person and send them into a herd of pigs. I can do all things by the power and authority of the Father who sent me. He's showing to them that there's something much greater in their presence by doing this. And then he says to them in verse 20, But if it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. And if you look at it in the Greek form, it's really that the kingdom of God has now descended upon you. I want you to think about the power of that word. But if I am who I say I am, you who, who challenge me, you who think that I'm in league with, with Lucifer, I've shown you my power, and if and if you really think about what you're seeing, if you really see the evidence, if maybe I'm right and I have been sent by the Father and what I'm doing is truly of divine authority, then the kingdom of God has now descended upon you. For those who don't stand with God or those who stand against Jesus, that would be a very frightening statement. That somebody would come up and be doing miraculous work and somebody says, I reject it, I reject it. And that person says, okay, you don't believe me. But consider the fact that everything that I'm doing evidences that I have come from God. But you stand against me, you are now my enemy. But if I'm right, and this is all from God, that means that the kingdom of God has now descended and you're on the wrong side of the line. That would be very frightening to me. And I wonder if the people understood what, what Jesus is saying here. He said, you can't have it both ways. You can't claim to cast out uh, uh, you know, by the power of God and yet not give credit to Jesus. And now he's saying, make a choice about me. Pick your side, but choose wisely. That's a very scary proposal. And I think that we see the dividing line more and more clearly happening here today. I mean, I think God can say that to the churches today. Be very careful what you do. Be careful what you decide to stand for. Because you need to choose wisely. Because if not, then the kingdom of God shall descend and you will find yourself on the wrong side. And I think that that's what's happening here. And this leads to the message of the miracle, which is the parable of the binding of the strong man. 
that we're going to look at. Any questions or comments, though? I know I said a lot there. But I want you to really give some thought to verse 20. But if I'm right, he said, so here's, you know, think of the logic. But if I'm right, and I am of God, then the kingdom of God has now descended. In other words, I'm bringing the kingdom of God. There's a new kingdom. There's a new sheriff in town. That's what he's saying. Are you sure you're on the right side? All right, so let's look at verses 21 to 23. Is everybody okay? Okay. Am I giving you all food for thought? Y'all are either I pensive or sleeping? Yeah, I was just thinking about, um, I, I've seen some, you know, videos of uh, people who are bad and some of the things they're great tools on how to confront the questions that the world throws at you. You want to be prepared and... Um, one of the one of the questions that I do see a lot of these individuals use um, when they when they're preaching, they they say to them, um, "Okay, this is the gospel X, Y, and Z. Now you've now rejected and said, you know, this is no, I'm, I'm good. You know, I don't believe it. Okay, but if I'm right, because that's basically what they, they say to the world when they're talking to them. But if I'm right, what does that mean for you, like?" And then you see their faces because they have to normally because they're on camera and they're kind of shy and afraid. They don't want to admit that they're wrong or they could be wrong. And but their face says it all. Like I'm not sure. I don't really know if there is a God. And you can tell that they can. They go home with those thoughts of, oh man, what if he's right? What if I am wrong? That does mean that I do go to hell. That I mean. And have I weighed the consequences? Yes. And I think that's what Jesus is doing here. He goes, have you really thought this through? Think it through. And have you weighed the consequences of your decision? You've decided I am not of God. You've decided that I'm, I'm, I'm in league with Lucifer. You've decided that my, my ministry is false. Despite all the evidence. But if I'm right, then the kingdom of God has now descended upon you. That is powerful. And this is why Jesus concludes his response with the parable here. Uh, and this is the message of the miracle, which is the third slide. The binding of the strong man that we read in verses 21 to 23. Somebody read verses 21 to 23. When a strong man fully armed guards his own palace, his goods are safe. But when one stronger than he attacks him and overcomes him, he takes away his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoil. Whoever is not with me is against me. Whoever does not gather with me scatters. Thank you. So, Jesus presents an allegory here. And it's this allegory about a strong man. And this strong man is fully armed. And uh, he has goods. It's almost like he's got this castle, right? And he's guarding and protecting all that he has, his property. But then he says, but then he's totally powerless when this stronger man comes. And he attacks him. He overcomes him. He strips him of his armor. He leaves him basically naked. And he takes away everything he has. Now Luke's version doesn't mention anything about the binding of the strong man. But I told you that Matthew shares this story. That's the one thing that Matthew does mention. When Jesus shares of this, uh, of this version, he says, When this stronger man comes, he binds the strong man and then goes and he pillages and takes everything. So there's this binding of the strong man that Matthew uh, shares. Let me ask you, who do you think is the strong man that is bound? Satan. Okay. It's okay. It's it, it can be confusing. Who do you think is the strong man that is bound? Don't be afraid. Marco, you said Satan. Satan. You agree? Could it at some level be ourselves because we like in our own like sometimes we're just we're too smart, we're too oh gosh, I, this is why I don't like talking because I don't know how to express myself. My brain goes like at a that's okay. Miles let it hour. That's okay, let it let Man. it <laughs> let, let it let really it weird. No, it's okay, let it process. So Marco, you are correct. What G, what Jesus is saying here is I've come and I've demonstrated by the power that I have even over the demons themselves. 
He says, let me, let me explain something to you, Pharisees and scribes. Here's this man who's strong and he has his kingdom and he's got all these goods and he's got armor and he's protecting and he's armed to the hilt. But then this other stronger man comes and he binds him and he takes and pillages everything. So if the strong man that is bound is Satan, who is the stronger man? God, Jesus. Jesus. He's saying, and I'm the stronger man. I've come and I've bound uh, Satan. Now I would say this, Veronica, you say, you know, that it could represent ourselves. That sometimes we can bind ourselves. I would say sometimes we allow Satan to bind us, like our sin. Uh, and, and I want everybody to think about this, especially those of you online. Have you ever considered your sinful activity or the things that you do that are not really holy and pleasing to God or really shouldn't be a part of your walk with God? Have you ever considered those things to be binding effects? Like glue or concrete that sticks on your feet or chains? Because, you know, we hear like uh, unchained, right? Or like uh, the chains that bind us. It's interesting that the scriptures describe that word, the chains that bind us. Well, who do you think puts those chains on us? Satan. Like bringing up our past. Yes. So it could be, it could be guilt. It could be bringing up our past. It could be uh, lust. It could be pornography. It could be drugs, alcohol. It could be anger. It could be those people who struggle to, to, to watch their language or, and they're mean and hurtful to their loved ones and they say hor you know, horrible things and then they have to come back and apologize. Um, it could be a, a measure of things. The thing is, is that Jesus is defining G uh, uh, Satan now as a whipped enemy. And in this day and time, people feared the, the demoniacs. People feared the, 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 the spiritual forces of darkness. People were in terror of that. People of, were afraid to go out at night because they, were, they, they felt that there were dark forces out there. Which is one of the reasons why you really need to avoid these, uh, these movies that teach about these evil demonic spirits and all that stuff. Because what Hollywood does is it presents them as more powerful than us. And it presents them as being in control. And Jesus all the while says, no, I'm the stronger man now. I have come. I have bound him. I have stripped him of his armor. He's got nothing. And remember, think of the, uh, think of the, uh, uh, the temptation in the wilderness. And Jesus goes and, and Satan finds him thinking, oh, I've got him isolated and he's weak. He hasn't eaten for 40 days. Uh, maybe you've got a chance against him. And he goes and first he tempts him to, to, to turn the stones into bread because he's like, I'm sure he's hungry. I'm going to see if I can tempt him to, to use his divine powers for his own benefit, which is not what Jesus came to do. And he says, no, you know, but man shall not live by, by uh, bread alone, but by every word that comes from the word of God, right? Then he says, okay, well, well then... Go up here on this cliff and, and cast yourself down and the angels will, 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 will pick you up. See, the source of that miracle, or of that temptation, I'm sorry, was that if Jesus were to do that, from that top of that hill, and it would, were the area where, Jesus, where Satan tempted Jesus, it would be visible to everyone. In other words, Satan is saying, go up to that top of that hill and do this in witness of everyone of your glory. In other words, go ahead and reveal yourself to everyone. It's like, no, I didn't come to be the king your way. Don't tell anybody about this. We just did a few Because it wasn't time. Many times he said, please, you know, refrain from Right. So, so Jesus is like, I'm going to come my way, not your way, right? And then finally the third one, he offers them what? The world. All the kingdoms of the, of the world. I'll give you all of this if you just bow down before me. You know what Satan says? He acknowledges. He, Satan doesn't say to him, oh, no, Satan, this world isn't yours. It's mine, even though it is his. He doesn't say, oh, no, Satan, you don't have the authority to give that to me because I'm the creator of this world. No, Jesus responds to that because even Scripture tells us that he is the prince of this world. He tells, he tells us he's the God of this world for a time. Instead, Jesus says, get away from me. Get away from me, Satan. And the, the amazing thing of that is that Satan says, the man standing before me is worth more than the entire world. Satan is the prince of the world, and he's willing to put it all in and says, I'll, I'll give you all of that. All I want is you. And yet, we're offered Jesus. We're offered Jesus, really, on our part, free of charge, of course, at the ultimate cost of Jesus, right? We're offered Jesus, and so how many people reject it? And I wonder if the enemy's looking at it and goes, you're, you're an idiot. I would be willing to trade the world for him. 
And there are people who deny him and reject him. And I'm sure Satan looks back and goes, thank God for stupidity. Thank God for stupidity because those are the people that I get to take to hell with me. But really, that's what's happening here. And so Jesus is saying, I have now bound this strong man. This strong man, I've plundered him. I've divided his kingdom. This world is now mine. In other words, when, when Satan offers him the world, Jesus is saying, no, Satan, I'm not going to let you give it to me. I'm here to take it. I'm asking permission. I'm not asking for permission. <laughs> this world is mine, and it, it, and it will be mine. And so Jesus is, is setting himself up and showing here that the strong man is Satan, and up until Jesus arrived, the world was his. But no more. There's a new sheriff in town. Go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 through 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 through 4. So before Jesus came, Satan did everything he could to arm himself. The Son of God is coming. The Messiah is coming. Jesus is coming. And boy, he was arming himself to the hilt. But he was powerless. There was nothing that he could do because Jesus is the stronger man. And he stripped him of all power. And how much more so at the cross? How much more so at the cross when the enemy said, Ha, oh, I did it. I killed the Son of God. Woo, I thought I was going to lose. I thought I was going to lose this world. He didn't know that he was playing into the hand. Everything that he was doing was all part of God's divine plan. Little did he know that was his greatest defeat. That's it. Jesus died on the cross. He thought he had his greatest victory when, when in actuality was his greatest defeat. Yeah, amen. So somebody read for me 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 through 4. So, do you see in verse 4, in their case, the God of this world? That, that G should be a little G. I'm very particular when it comes to, to translation and stuff like that. I mean, I've been taught to do that. Do you all have a big G or a little G? Little right? G. Does anybody have a big G? If you have a big G, you mark it out. And you put a little G. Because what Paul is saying here, that when we're preaching to people and we're sharing the gospel, that there are some that are going to reject it. And he's saying, let me tell you why they're going to reject it. Because the little g God of this world, verse 4, has blinded the minds of the unbelievers. That's a little g. All the translations online have the, uh, capital G. It should be a little g. It should be a little g. Because the God of this world refers to Satan. And to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel... Of the glory of Christ, who is the image of Big G. So, understand that here Jesus is saying there's a new sheriff in town, and his name is Jesus. Number two, this world is now his. This world is now mine. And number three, he's defeated sin and death by defeating Satan. And he's now the Lord and God of this world. Big G. And so Jesus issues a final ultimatum, and we'll close with this. Verse 23, going back to Luke, uh, Luke, where were we? Luke 11. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. So Jesus is issuing a final ultimatum, and he's saying to them, neutrality is not an option. Okay, you can't be Switzerland. Doing your own thing is not an option. Deciding no comment is not an option. It's time to choose sides, but choose wisely. Because if I write, then the kingdom of God has now descended upon you. I'm, I'm telling you, that statement is, is powerful. That would be like a parent talking to their 10-year-old and saying, hey, who broke this land? Who broke this lamp? And, and the parent already knows because they've got a security camera, right? No, no, I didn't do it, didn't do it. Are you sure? Because I'm going to ask around. No, 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 I didn't do it, didn't do it. Are you sure you didn't do it? No, okay. Now, I want you to think about it because if right now, if you, you admit to it and everything, then you're going to be grounded for, for, for the afternoon. But if I find that you're lying and you refuse to admit it, then the entire 
authority and discipline. And the, my wrath shall descend upon you. This is your last chance. Would that be frightening to live <laughs> Like, man, Irby, don't traumatize your kids. But, um, but that's kind of what it's like. It's like, you better choose wisely. You better choose wisely because after this, if, it, if it's true what I say, then the kingdom of God has descended upon you. If I was ever preaching this, it would be that. That would be the title. And that's what Jesus is saying. If I am who I say I am, and if I do what I do by the one who I say has sent me, then the kingdom of God is now here. And for those who believe, that's great news. But Jesus is not good news for everyone. Jesus was not good news for Satan, and he's certainly not good news for those who reject Jesus. Because now there's a judgment um, falling upon them. And so um, it, it's a strong way to finish, but that's how Jesus specifically finishes it. Whoever's not with me is against me. You have to choose. You can't be, well, I'm spiritual, I just don't believe. Or Jesus, uh, have you ever heard this? Jesus was a great teacher. Look, I can't believe he's a son of God. And I remember C.S. Lewis talking about this. He goes, stop with this garbage about, well, Jesus was a good teacher. I'll accept that Jesus was a good teacher and everything. No, garbage. Either Jesus was who he said he was, or he was a lunatic or the, or the son of Satan himself. He says, because the man claimed to be the son of God. He didn't claim to be a good teacher. He didn't claim to be a rabbi. He claimed to be the son of God. He claimed to be God in the flesh. Now, he either was or he wasn't. You can't make a middle ground because Jesus didn't make a middle ground. He either is or he is not who he said he was. And you have to choose. And that's what Jesus is saying. You're either with me or you're against me. And see, people don't like to, to teach or preach this version of what Jesus says. But Jesus says it clearly there. A choice has to be made. And unless that person acknowledges and accepts Jesus for who he is, then they're lost where they stand. You can't have a middle ground. Well, you know, I'll, I'll accept Jesus as, as, as a wise man and a good teacher. You know, maybe, maybe they'll let me in, you know, through the back door in heaven. There's no back door in heaven. Either he is who he said he is or he's not. And whoever does not gather with me scatters. In other words, you're either doing my work or you're not. You can do a lot of good things in your mind. But if you're not gathering with me, if you're not doing work with me, whatever works you think you're doing are useless and will not save you. And uh, that's, and remember, he's not only speaking here to the Pharisees and to the scribes, but he's speaking to everyone who will listen. You're either with me or you're not. Questions or comments? I, um, I have to believe that when Jesus healed this mute man, it was not only for the glory of God, but I can tell you what this man now started speaking. God gave him a voice now. And I believe wholeheartedly that this man, now that he had a voice, was going to use it to go and tell of the good things that the Lord had done for him. And that's what we have. Um, you don't have to be a theologian. You don't have to have uh, uh, you know, degrees or anything to tell people your story. Your story could be more powerful than any kind of theological exercise somebody would share. If you just tell people what God has done for you. I, I spoke to a couple of members here over the last few months, um, and one of them shared that with me. He says, Pastor, I, I really want to share you know, the gospel, but I just don't feel like I can do a good job with it, and I just don't feel like I'm good with words. And I told him, just tell them your story. Just tell them your story. Any person, we're moved by stories. Any person, when you say, look, you know, I don't know all the fancy theological stuff, but what I can tell you is what God did for me. Here's what God did for me. That will move mountains. God will do all the rest for you. And so I think that that, that, that to me is a great way to, to close this whole idea on the miracles. You can do wondrous things if you just open your mouth and share what God has done. Jesus opened the mouth of this mute man. And I have little doubt that this man used that voice to praise God for the rest of his life. Let's do that. Let praise pour out from your lips, man. Just speak of the good things that God has done for you. Let it be part of your language, your everyday language. So so much so that it just naturally flows. And God will honor you for that. I think a lot of the times, too, our walk is, if you're not ready to get into the theology and all of that, 
um, because everybody's at a different place. I think that, especially if you've been working somewhere, for example, for two years, and they see your walk, they see what kind of person you are, they see when they make coarse jokes that you don't laugh at that, you know, all those things count. People are watching. Or, you know, if, if they're drinking and they stay in the office after work and you're like, all right, I gotta go. Those little things make you stand out. And so if you do have a chance to say, oh, well, I used to be like this. I used to smoke two packs a day. You know, I used to curse like a sailor. And they just kind of will look at you like, what? But what I see now is nothing compared to, you know, what I see. And so you don't, you don't even have to get into the theology. Your walk is enough. Should be. Should be enough, correct. Right? It should be. Should it should be. be. It should be. And so if you, yes. and, and, and the opposite is true. Because let's say you have all the theology yes. in the world yeah. and, and, and you're acting like a fool, right? And you're you're acting like a heathen, they'll say, Man, yeah, you know a lot of the, the word, but you don't live any of it, right? So I, I agree with you. Uh, that that we have to be I think that our actions speak a whole lot louder than our words do. Yeah. Thank you. I agree with you. And um I think that Jesus sets it very clearly for these people and really for all time for all of us to consider. Um, Jesus is now the God of this world. He is now the master and commander. Of, and he's defeated death. That doesn't mean that Satan isn't you know, roaring around like a, a prowling, prowling around like a roaring lion still. But he's, the, he's a defeated lion. He's not the real lion. He's like a lion. He's not the lion. The lion of the tribe of Judah now reigns. And we have that victory. I've drawn my lines, and I know you have too. And I've picked my side, and I know you have too. But Jesus is not asking us to pick sides to make the other's enemies. He's asking us to pick sides so that we can see that there is a dividing line, and he wants us to bring others over to this side. And that's the point. All right, well, Marty, no comments or questions online? No comments about uh, Jesus must be the Lord over our lives. Jesus must be the Lord over our lives. Amen. Amen. Any other comments? And just, you know, one of the greatest things is to give our te personal testimony. The greatest thing is to give our personal testimony. Amen. I totally agree. I think that our, te our personal testimony uh, is um, is uh, the most powerful weapon we have against against uh, the forces of darkness. So, thank you all for watching online and for connecting with us. We continue to pray for our community, our church, and all of you out there. And uh, let's uh, close in prayer. Kayla, thank you again. Uh, I'm looking forward to our yes. our worship now being filled with a, a praise song. And just that one song can do wonders. So you're all right. You're doing good. Let's go to the Lord. Lord, Father, I thank you and just thank you for this study and the reminder of, of, of the fact that your son came to conquer and conquer he did. The reminder that he is now the ruler and the God of this world. A reminder that, that he reigns. He has defeated death. Lord, let us learn to live in this victory. Lord, let us, as, as believers, as Christians, let us walk and talk and live and act like we're, we're, we're victorious. Lord, let us not walk around like defeated people. Let us not walk around with our heads down. Let us walk around with our heads high knowing that, that the choice that we have made is the right choice. Lord, that we have chosen the Son of God as our Savior, and that he is now the strong man of this world. And that our hope is in him. And he has never and never will fail us. So Lord Father, let us learn to live in this victory. In this confidence and this hope. Knowing that you, you made us to walk around with our heads and our hearts and our spirits high and strong in this faith. Thank you for all who shared. Thank you for this service, Lord. May you bless us this week and all that we do. In Jesus' name, amen.